let's get into the top 25 prospects, actually just 25 to 11 here on the top 100 list where, I mean, I, I like where we're starting because we got another Cub and another guy that I just is, is one of my favorite prospects to watch hit right now. Matt Shaw of the Chicago Cubs should probably put second base slash third base with all the run that they're giving him at the, at the hot corner now. And, and, and really the, the focus of him potentially being the future there as he continues to work on the defense. But let's be real. It's all about the bat here with Matt Shaw. And, and that's why they're already trying to get him over to third base. See if he can hold his own there, because even if he can be an average defender, I mean, we're talking like Alec Bohm level defense. I, I, so it's slightly below average. I think that the bat is going to just be so good that you won't even really care. And the fact that he's so athletic, though, lends me, you know, leads me to believe that he can develop into an average third baseman, even with a fringy arm. Uh, but you're looking at a guy here that it's a plus hit tool. It's above average game power. The plate discipline is an interesting aspect of it because – he has such a good feel to hit. He's always been aggressive. I think it's just kind of who he is. I don't really see it being a major issue. One, because the, the feel to hit is so good. And two, because he can you know hit balls that are located in tough places, do damage on pitches that are slightly outside of the zone. Like those are the guys that when they chase, I, I'm, I'm a little bit more tolerant to it. And uh, you know we've seen pretty good out of zone contact rates from him so far as a pro and, and, and in college. I would say better than that. I'd say really good. Uh, so far. And I think that's the thing that really helps him. Just to contextualize it, I'd actually say they're elite as I'm pulling it up now. Uh, it since his pro debut uh, last year, and in, 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 you know, I know it was only like 30, 40 games, but out of zone contact rate, right around 70% is ridiculous. So I, I mean, like the average is right around 50. So yeah, he's going to be a little bit aggressive, but I think the hit tool is clearly plus there. And when you hit the ball as hard as he does, and you can motor a little bit too. He's going to be an offensive monster who could be up as soon as this year. Yeah, end of this year. Um, and we'll see what happens when it comes to the third base scenario. Like, hey, can Christopher Morell hold his own? As of right now, the returns are like sort of kind of not really. We'll see how the Cubs want to handle third base through the summer months. Like the season's five minutes old. I'm not ready to make a sweeping claim about Christopher Morell or, you know, even how they handle it with with understudy options at the big league level or even the AAA level. But it does feel like Shaw will be the third baseman for the Chicago Cubs by season's end. And I wonder if they looked at the Chapman contract situation developing the way it was. And they were just like, yeah, we're going to opt out because we feel like Shaw is farther along than maybe we initially anticipated. His 15 game run in double A was fun. His 20 game run in high A last year with South Bend was next level fun. It was a joy to tap into on an every night basis. And it's like, oh, Matt Shaw like went three for five again. Look at this cat. Yeah. He hit 393 in 20 games in high A. And he was slugging. Like it was four doubles, three triples, four homers. It's 11 extra base hits in 20 games. He was seven for eight on the base pads. He was the perfect ball player when he got into pro ball last year. Yeah. I mean, the speed was really impressive too. He can motor. I don't think people gave him enough credit for that. And then the ability to drive it to all fields when we saw him pummel some, some balls the other way. And then, I mean, the, the, what really stood out to me was when I was at spring training, big league spring training and watching, I, I think it was Jolie Rodriguez or no, who's the lefty that the Padres brought in this past year. The, the lefty? I'll get to that in a second, but yeah. lefty reliever. Who's just absolutely gross. Um, I think he was with the Yankees before uh, and, and a few other teams bounce around a little bit. But anyways, I'll get to, back to that in a second. Yeah. He was absolutely carving everybody up, and it looked like he was just going to shut the door. Gets a bad swing from Matt Shaw, who calls time, kind of recalibrates, gets back Wandy in. Wandy Peralta. Sorry, Wandy Peralta. Wandy yeah. Peralta is the answer. Thank you. He was looking gross, and Shaw just recalibrates, puts a great swing on a ball, double into the gap, and then Wandy just like, made quick work of the next guy but it was crazy he made three hitters looking extremely uncomfortable a couple of big leaguers and then matt shaw took one bad swing recalibrated and put one of the better swings i saw really my whole time in arizona on a tough pitch that he still split the gap in left center 
it just seems like against the most advanced arms, he rarely takes two bad swings in a row, even though he's a little bit more aggressive. He'll take that bad swing, he'll recalibrate, and then he'll put a really good swing on a ball. So I just love what he does in the box. I love the adjustability. You'll see him in advantage counts, you know, take a bigger leg kick and let it eat. You'll see when he feels a bit more rushed, he will have a smaller leg kick or more of a toe tap. I even asked him about that. And he said, it's kind of autopilot now. Like I don't even really think about, oh, I should lift my leg higher this time or lower this time. Just naturally, if he feels rushed, naturally his leg doesn't go up as high and he's a little bit quicker to his launch position. And when he feels really comfortable and he's seeing a beach ball, he can really let it eat and not have to worry about how quickly he gets to the launch position. That is the definition of an innate hitter. Yes. I think that gets thrown out a lot. That's like an innate feel for the barrel, just an innate feel for hitting and a good athlete. And that's why I will bet on this guy any day of the week. And the fact that he can hedge the chase with ridiculous out of zone contact rates. And on top of that, hits the crap out of the ball, 90th percentile in his pro stint. That was you know, a decimal point under 107 miles an hour. This guy's going to be a doubles machine, can hit you 20 to 25 homers. And even if he doesn't walk a lot, he's not going to K too much as he settles in. I feel really good about Shaw, whether he's you know an average defender or slightly below that. And so far this spring, they've mostly given him reps at third. He can still move over to second base. He's a really fun player. He also could probably steal 15 to 20 bags too. Yeah, that, that's also the best example of leaning into what's best for you, like leaning into what makes you unique and what makes you great. Because if you were to take a 12-year-old and throw them in private lessons and you want to teach them perfect swing mechanics and perfect pitching mechanics, they're not going to look like anybody on the top 100. None of no. these guys are mechanically perfect. There are very few guys that like are superstars in Major League Baseball that are Hall of Famers that were mechanically perfect. They just do what's most comfortable for them and they do what makes them great. And that I think is the perfect example of like, yeah, I'm not going to overthink that. Like, I'm just going to do what feels right. Feel is the most important word in baseball. And it feels like he's got great feel for who he is. It's amazing to have that kind of malleability without really being focused on it and thinking about it too, which yeah. just shows you how, how natural it is for Matt Shaw. Uh, I'm, I'm pumped to see what he's going to do this year. 24, another natural hitter here is is Cole Young shortstop with the Seattle Mariners Young has just been a beast since he was drafted 21st overall in 2022 and nothing jumps off of the page with him but you're also going to really struggle to find an issue with him especially after watching him play defense as well that was a fun watch for me because I, I think you look at his build you're like oh you know maybe it's a little bit more of a second base uh, profile but then you watch the way he moves it short. He stays so low to the ground uh, and, and it's just working under and behind the ball so well. Uh, good range, good arm. There's, there's the actions are so smooth. And then the bat. I mean, I'm watching this guy turn around pitches that are two, three balls inside and still keep it fair. We've seen him flash exit velocities of 110 miles an hour. And one of the best approaches you're going to find at the lower levels uh, last year. I mean, extremely patient. Really good feel for the strike zone. So you have the potential for plus hit, plus plate discipline. I do think he could grow into average game power or close to it because of how hard he already hits the ball and his ability to mix in some, some pull side loft. He's an above average runner, above average shortstop. That's not only a high probability big leaguer, that's a high probability above average big league shortstop relative to, to most other prospects. Yeah, he played, what, 10 games in big league spring training? 14 games. He had 25 plate appearances, two doubles, two homers in big league spring. So that tells you that he's not phased by the moment whatsoever. I'd assume that he starts in double A. I have not seen the rosters come out for Seattle just yet. Um, but, I mean, he had an 890 OPS pretty much in, in Everett over 50 games. So that's high yeah. A. He's succeeded everywhere. You mentioned it's it's some of the best play discipline you saw at the lower levels last year. Do you think this guy can be like a career 400 OBP guy? It feels like he can, because even if he's not hitting 290 like he did last year and he hits 270, he'll hedge it with so many walks. And I, I feel like this guy is going to get on base. He's going to lean more into the stolen bases. He had 22 in 32 attempts last year. He was a pretty inefficient base dealer. Yeah. I feel like he's going to become more efficient the deeper he gets into pro ball because he's been such a quick learner level by level. 
Yeah, and he's just like too heady of a baseball player, like you're saying, like the quick corner. Even without being a burner, he's fast enough with the way that he plays the game. I'm I I think he'll become an efficient base dealer, absolutely. Uh, and and just even looking at some of the big league spring training swings that he got off to, uh, one of the doubles was a, a down the line off of Abner Uribe on a slider. No, not many people do that, you know, even at the big league level right now. He hit a home run. I know it's in Arizona, the ball flies, but he hit a home run 440 feet. Uh, so he's also got a little bit of the pop there. He had another slider over 400 feet in spring training. And then he had a backside double over 400 feet that somehow didn't get out of the yard. So it, it, it's just this ridiculous barrel accuracy, this ability to get to different pitches, maximized by phenomenal plate discipline, and just such an efficient stroke overall. It just, again, I, he, he might not be a perennial all-star, but when I'm picking prospects that I'd like to start my franchise with, I can sleep real well knowing that I have my potential future shortstop in Cole Young. And if for whatever reason, there's, you know, like a Lindor type of situation where, you know, and then even you can look at it right now with, with, with Crawford, uh, you know, with Crawford at the big league level, if, if he's still doing his thing there, if you put Cole Young at second base, hmm. he's going to be a gold glove caliber second baseman. And that offensive profile will even be more impactful because I think he's going to provide a little bit more impact than you get from the average second baseman. That said, he can absolutely play a good shortstop and, and provide more than enough offense there as well. I love the floor here, but there's still a pretty pretty decent sized ceiling uh, when you have all of the things going for him that, that Cole Young does. Hey, man, crop of prospects. I like You've got them. Hey, choose who you want to start your franchise with. I think the argument can be made that you're taking – Cole Young over the guy that's number 23, to be honest, just because you know the floor is way, way higher. Yeah. And people kind of kick and scream about the, the the guy at 23 because I think you see him as a top 10 prospect in a lot of other places. Ethan Salas, catcher in the San Diego Padres org. This is a really fun year for him because we saw him fast tracked. And then whatever the extreme example would be of fast tracked, like I, I would just say pushed and there's uh, just thrown wherever he could play more games and, and, you know, play with, with more experienced competition and be in a different spot. But uh, him getting to double a didn't really matter. I think at all, like I, I know that it was cool to say, and it's like, Oh wow, this teenager you know, in his age sure. 17 season got to double a, and it, it is remarkable that he can get there and not look like me or you out there. Uh, but at the, with that said, it's not something that, he totally like, Oh, he hit his way up to double a like, wow, this guy's a, the, the number five prospect in baseball. I, I think most of the people that rank him that high though, it, it's not because he got that double a cameo. It's because of the fact that he showed some really good things in big league spring training. I think he was 16 at the time. He showed some really good things in low a where he more than looked the part. Uh, you look at the field of hit. It's, it's really impressive for a player of his age. You get the approach. It's really impressive for a player of his age. You get the receiving. It's really impressive for a player of his age. So, and then the makeup of course is great as well. There's so much to like here. Another extremely high probability big leaguer. When you look at the skill set at 17 years old and the polish at 17 years old, my question is though, is, you know, what does this all look like when it's all said and done? How much more, power is there to dream on how much better is he going to get because i think he the thing that makes Salas really unique is that i think he's like closer to what it could look like as a finished product than most 17 year olds i, I don't know if i have as much projection to dream on i know he's going to continue to get better and better and better i'm not saying that but we look at some other 17 year olds that show well at the lower levels and it's like oh wow and he's just barely tapping into what he can be I think what makes Salas so good already is that he's already tapping into what he can be. Yeah. He's going to get better, but I just the, the one reason why you know he's not really as high for us as others. He's still the twenty third ranked prospect. Is that I don't know if I see the same ceiling maybe that others see, but I see a really high probability left handed hitting catcher who could be well above average at the position, potentially an all star, and yeah. that hit tool could end up trending closer to, to plus plus. And if that happens, I definitely see how he can be one of the top, top guys in, in the in the minor leagues. But I just haven't seen enough yet to confidently say, oh, he's going to blossom into a 70 hit. 
Yeah. Note the word that you'll hear whenever people and evaluators talk about Ethan Salas. The word is advanced. He's one of the most advanced teenagers that we've ever seen. He's probably the most advanced 17-year-old that we've ever seen. Advanced is good because advanced means that you've got a lot of the, the I don't know, growth and learning out of the way, or at least in the rear view, and, and you're already achieving what many thought you could achieve. But advanced also should kind of key into your mind that like he may be closer to a finished product than you would expect, like you're saying. So the word advanced, I think, is very telling with Ethan Salas. Um, and I, I like the point that you make, and I'm not trying to sound like a hater here, but I mean, him getting to double A and other guys playing their way to double A are two entirely different things. Like that was borderline malpractice by the San Diego Padres. He played 17 games above low A. He had a 35 WRC plus. Like, let's stop doing this to guys like that. Yeah. I wonder what that did to his confidence. I, I feel like right, being right, in double A alone, probably nothing. The positive of being in double A at 17 is like the best confidence boost ever, but like not performing well at all in high air double A is another knock. So I feel like he just came back to level water. Um, yeah. But I, obviously he's, he's incredible for the age, but again, it's, it's a proximity thing. It's an age proximity thing. And I think that's why so many other people are like he's a top 10 prospect in baseball because he already gets to double A as a as a 17 year old. No, you got to look at the situation here and you got to add context. And and again, like you have to understand that he may be closer to a finished product now than than you expect from a ton of teenagers. Yeah, and you know, the models are gonna love the team models are gonna love the age to, to level well. Yeah. Situation. The age to level situation is always gonna be. Uh, you know, something that's that's really important and, and it is. And that's why I think it really elevates his floor as a guy that you, you feel really good about being a, a solid big leaguer. And again, I think if that hit tool continues to, to trend closer to that 70 grade, then yeah, I mean you've got you've got a guy that I mean a left-handed hitting catcher who's a plus to plus plus hitter with average game power and potentially plus defense. Yeah, that's a that's a top prospect in the game if that all continues to come together. But I just feel like we got to see that a little bit more. Uh, we haven't really seen that much Ethan Salas yet. I've seen enough to make him a top 25 prospect in baseball. But I, I'm just interested to see what it looks like now, uh, you know, in, in, in what will be high A now, where they'll, they'll finally settle him back in yep. and, and see how he performs there this season. The good news is, is if he struggles a little bit, he's going fin to fin finish the year. He's still eight, 18 years old. He's going to start next year still being 18 years old. So he's got all the time in the world. And again, that's another reason why I think he's really highly rated. But at the same time, I, I do wonder how much upside there possibly is and how much is dependent on the defense progressing as much as people are expecting it to and the hit tool progressing as much as people are expecting it to. I think both really can. I just want to see it a little bit more. Yeah. 22. Not too much that we can say about this guy, unfortunately. Andrew Painter right-handed pitching prospect with the Phillies. I just think for Painter, it would be valuable because he hasn't thrown in so long, right? We haven't really seen him because of the Tommy John surgery and the delay, given that you know, he tried to avoid surgery and then ended up needing it anyway. So it you know just delayed the process of being able to recover. Let's just talk about how good he was in 2022. I think we've gotten to the point now where we're so removed from it. Everyone knows how good Andrew Painter is, but maybe people don't remember how dominant things were for him at points and, and what it looked like through stretches where, I mean, you look at his last 10 starts in 22, he landed all of his pitches for a strike at a 71% clip. He struck out 35% of hitters walked 2.7% of hitters. That's 76 Ks to six walks. Opponents at 205. I mean, that is outrageous. And mind you, that was in double A, mostly. So it was five starts in double and then five starts in high A doing that. A 1-4-2 ERA in 57 innings. 76 punch outs, six walks. And the craziest part is it was the last outing of the season that really inflated him. And I think he just kind of ran out of gas a little bit. If you subtract that, and maybe that elbow was starting to bother him, you, you never know. 
if you subtract that last outing and you go one more earlier, 10 starts, 0-6-4 ERA, 56 innings, 75 punch outs, six walks, a 180 opponent batting average. The guy was overpowering everybody despite being way younger than everybody as well. And we're talking about that. Like this was, he was the arm you didn't want to face in double A, even though he was the youngest guy that you were going to face in double A. What would you consider to be a great home run rate? Like what home run percentage against? That's a good question. I would say pretty much anything under 3% is pretty damn good. Under 3%. Okay. He was 1.2%. I mean, that's crazy. He was five homers. He faced 401 hitters. Five took him deep between low A, high A, and double A. Yeah. Um, I think anything under 3% is like elite. Yeah. I'll, I'll run you through just like the baseline stats at each level. Nine starts in low A Clearwater, a 1 4 ERA, 38 and two thirds innings. He punched out 69 and walked 16. So that's 16 Ks per nine and under four walks per nine. Then he goes to Jersey Shore for eight starts, a 0.98 ERA, 36 and two thirds, 49 punch outs, seven walks. Then he goes to Reading, like you're talking about, and even including the blow up start at the end. A 2-5 ERA and five starts, 28 and a third, 37 punch outs, two walks. 37 to two in double A as a 19-year-old. There's a reason that he was like a consensus top 10 prospect, Mm -hmm. at least top 15 prospect in baseball going into 2023. Baseball America had him five. Do you remember where we had him going into 2023? Oh, man. I'm trying to remember. I mean, I, I top ten. I remember clearly that it was top ten. I remember stumbling upon him, like not stumbling upon, but just stumbling upon like one, the data. I mean, obviously, he was a first round pick, but I don't know if people were really keyed in. I wasn't keyed in that much, and I was just doing a query on you know fastballs that were getting the most vert early on, and 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 velo, uh, you know, just a velo vert query that I always just love to do late at night when I'm just sitting around, and I was getting some painter fastballs in there. And I was like, all right, you know what? I want, I want to see more of this. I start watching some of these guys, this guy starts, and I'm like, holy crap. This is this is some some special stuff. I didn't think he'd continue it the way he did at each stop, especially because he's six seven. And when he was in high school, Calvary Christian, he the command was a little bit of a question. Like it, when he was selected, it was like, okay, like let's see how he develops, type of thing. It was kind of similar to the Mick Abel situation. And I think he had even you know, a little bit less steam than Mick Abel. Just to see what he's doing, what he was doing from a polished perspective. And look, if he comes back from Tommy John surgery and the command isn't totally there, don't be alarmed. We, we talked about it with Lesko, who was very much, I think, loved for how smooth the delivery was in his command. It's going to take a little bit of time. But the thing that put me over the top with Painter was he starts throwing the change up more down the stretch. And he he still didn't throw it enough. I think he should have thrown it more. But down the stretch, he started to mix it in about seven percent of the time, and it was it was looking like a plus pitch or better. He's seventy three percent strike rate over those final six starts, uh, a twenty seven percent swinging strike rate when he threw it. it. It was nasty. So you have that fastball that's plus plus. You have that slider that's plus, and then you have a changeup that flashes plus. Like you got three plus pitches, command that looks like when he was. Going right there through the whole season looks like it could track towards plus, or you know, for his age was definitely in that sixty territory. I mean, what can you what can you really poke a hole in with Andrew Painter at this point, other than uh, the the UCL, which they already fixed? So uh, I, I think you look at him coming back, assuming everything is is normal, and it's just kind of a run of the mill Tommy John. Painter is going to be right back to the top dog, I think, pitching prospect wise, because everybody else will be graduated, I think, at that point. Maybe not Job, but it'll be maybe him and Job. But I think it wouldn't surprise me if Job is graduated by that time. He, he's 22 now because he's been unavailable. And I was going to make that exact point. I was like, we'll play the what if game for a moment. If he didn't get hurt, I do think that he's a better pitching prospect at this point than, than Skeens and Job. But I also think that he'd be graduated by now. I think mm-hmm. that he would have gotten up at midseason last year. And I think yep. that he would have pitched in in the NLCS last year. I think he would have started a game at 20 years old in the NLCS. I he, absolutely agree. He's pitch by pitch, I think, the best pitcher in minor league baseball. 
And I know that, you know, Skeens' slider may be better than than Painter's slider. And, you know, Job may have a pitch per, that performs better than Painter. But if you go pitch by pitch and you're telling me you can have a 70 fastball, 70 slider, 60 curveball, 55 change, and 60 command, that guy pound for pound sounds like the best pitcher in minor league baseball. It's very similar to the Grayson Rodriguez conversation yeah. from 20. I think he I think he could have got there if he was healthy last year. Like I think because I think he would have taken another step forward. I and mean, I think we would have saw a lot more confidence in the changeup. I think the you know the fastball, even maybe characteristic wise, there would have been some subtle improvements, even though it was already a really good fastball. I, I think he easily could have got there, but from what we have from two years ago to comparing to Job and, and Skeens, it's a fun conversation that I think we should revisit in a few weeks and kind of do a data and pitch performance kind of side by side of each of those guys. Uh, I think it. it'd be really, it'd be a fun thought exercise. That'd be kind of fun. Like where we, where we kind of measure them and we've got three columns. It's almost like a T chart. It's like who wins the fastball. We, we rank on fastball. We rank on slider. We yeah. rank on, yeah. That'd be yeah. Fun. We should do that. Cause, and, and I think it'd be a fun article as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And we can, you know, put them side by side from pitch performance to data, to command, to everything. Uh, because I think just that comment from you, like, I think it's valid. I would still lean towards the other two, but that could just be a recency and I've seen you bias thing. So it'd be yeah. really fun to put those guys on top of each other and see, you know, how, how they stack up. Yeah. Going to 21, another pitcher here and it's Cade Horton, who we could also absolutely throw into the mix here. This is an availability thing. Like you said, uh, in terms of the upside and potential and all that good stuff, I'm taking painter. But at this point, you know, we'll keep doing the starting your franchise situation. I think at this present moment, I'm, I'm assuming I don't have the medicals of Andrew Painter and all those things. So not knowing those things and not knowing quite to the extent of what those arm issues could be. I'm going to take the healthy and currently performing Horton by a, you know, just a millimeter. And that's where why he's 21 and, and, and we see Painter at 22. But the other reason is just Horton earned this too. I mean, Horton has just made it impossible to, to have him behind someone who can't throw right now because of how good he has been. Uh, that fastball, it's that cut ride heater that we see like from Justin Steele, ironically. Uh, it's a little bit different in the way that it cut rides, but it, it's a similar one that I think with Stuff Plus, it's not going to love it as much, but it's going to perform at a really high level. And we've seen that already. I mean, he has really blown that by hitters. Then you have a slider that's double plus. You have a curveball that he added really and adjusted that he has a ton of confidence in and is above average. And then that changeup also was something that I think put him over the top for me because now you got a four pitch mix and he, he changed the change up to have more of that split grip. And with more of the split grip, he was able to control it better because he's not a, he's not a pronator. Yeah. Doesn't have to pronate as much. And it had that natural arm side fade. He, he was com commanding it pretty darn well. So you got two plus pitches. You've got the elite pitch as well with that slider. And you've got a, a complete four pitch big league mix and above average command, a premium athlete on the mound. I know he's already had the Tommy John, but not a lot of miles on the arm otherwise and, and being a two way guy. And I just I just love what he does on the mound. And, and the field of pitch is, is pretty darn good as well for a guy that has not thrown that much. Right? Yeah. So I, I think it's only going to get better. He was, I think, the most uh, the most fun. It was really hard to decide between him and Robbie Snelling for minor league pitcher of the year for us. Yeah. Ultimately, the the workload of Snelling put and 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 how much he was challenged put him over the top. But I'd argue that Kate Horton was the most fun arm to watch last year. Uh, just when when he was going right, which was pretty much the whole year. Yeah, it was just dominance. I mean, stunk that he was capped at 88 and a third, but, you know, I, I get it. He was capped because he had thrown 53 and two-thirds innings since high school. Um, Cade, like, he was a legitimate two-way guy. Like, he got, I think, 150-something. Yeah, 168 plate appearances at Oklahoma during his draft year. He didn't hit well. Like, he was a 650 OPS guy in college, so I think that was a pretty easy decision. But I, I think that in 2022, this was a pick that, maybe left some people scratching their heads and it's like, Oh, he just hasn't pitched. Why are you doing yeah. that? Um, the Cubs clearly saw something. 
I've texted you a couple of times in the last week or so about Jed Hoyer, just like he's acing everything. And I, he looks great for, for staying away from some of, you know, the, the extensions that we thought the Cubs were going to hand out a couple of years ago and Bryant and Baez, those look terrible right now. Yeah. And, and they've leveled up and like, he's been drafting exceptionally well. This could be one of Jed Hoyer's biggest W's as, as general manager of the Cubs or president of baseball operations. I'm with you. I mean, and it was it, it was a, a money saving pick too. Which if you did a redraft, it, not only you're not saving money, he might not be there. Right. So it it whenever you can do that and it translates that quickly, you got to trust what Jed Hoyer is doing from a draft perspective. We talked about Zaire Hope, you know, who did ultimately get traded, but that ended up helping you get Michael Bush, uh, Jackson Ferris, like the way that they've been able to to kind of pluck players in, in later rounds as well, too, has been really impressive. Alfonsin Rosario, like we've been talking about, uh, but there's a lot of other, you know, I think, better examples of that as well. But also the scouting and trade returns, things like that have just been very impressive. Pitch by pitch breakdown here. Fastball opponents hit 230 against, which is you know more than acceptable when you're filling up the zone at the clip that he was and landing at first strike at 72% and a 15% swinging strike rate. Sliders opponents hit a buck 50 with a 66 percent strike right there the change up opponents at a buck 35 but that pitch got better and better for him as the year progressed and he started to land it for a strike way more by the time he got to his final 15 starts of the year opponents were below the mendoza line and by the time he got to his final 10 starts of the year he was landing it for a strike nearly at a 60 percent clip which you know is nothing to write home about but it is if you have the context of this was a pitch that he was really struggling with in the beginning and didn't really have before and then that curveball he only mixed it in about 10% of the time last year, but it was the perfect downer pitch that I think he he has a little bit more comfort with against lefties, but gives him a fourth look. And the days that the changeup's not there, it gives him that other speed in the the you know, mid eighties where he can just have a different action than the slider. And he's done a good job of separating those two breaking balls more. I, I, I really feel like he could be up this year as well if the Cubs need him. And I know he's still going to be on some sort of a pitch count, that fastball and slider really elevate the floor, and the fact that the, the curveball and changeup have already come along, I, I think this guy has number two, uh, a number two type of arsenal, and could you give you flashes and more. Uh, I'm going to try and be Nostradamus here. I bet that the Cubs shut him down for a little bit in the middle of the season, and then ramp him up at the end of the season. So I, I bet it's almost like a suspension bridge where you see C Cade go on the development list in like June. And he's hanging out for like a month and he's just throwing pens and sim games and all that. And then he goes back because last year was an early shutdown because he had no shot at the big leagues. But yeah. he'll get to Iowa. He'll pitch through the end of September and we'll see what happens. Yeah, I, I hope I hope he gets a shot this year. If these Cubs are hanging in there, they'll they'll find a way to make it happen. I agree. Another Cub who should probably get up one way or another if they're in the hunt. I'm very fascinated to see how they decide to use them, but we've talked about them a ton. Don't have to spend as much time. Pete Crow Armstrong, center fielder, Chicago Cubs org. I like some of the swing adjustments he's made, and I think it's going to result in more contact as he gets more comfortable simplifying things in the box, pretty much getting his hand started in his slot and just letting the natural athleticism go instead of having a little bit more movement. And it was a long journey to get to a slot and sink into it. Now it's pretty much rubber band effect, starting with tension and just going from there. I, I think it's going to be better for him. I think it's going to help him see the ball earlier and be more patient because the approach has been a challenge for him. And I think it's also going to result in just him being on time more consistently. And the bat speed's always been there and he's always been able to consistently elevate. And, and I think almost was getting a little bit too lofty which was resulting in, in a little bit too much whiff. So now a bit flatter to the ball working from, I think mentally on top of the ball, naturally you're not going to chop down on it. I think it's just that kind of feel versus real thing. And I think that's allowed him to make a bit more contact. I, I think he's going to be better this year from a whiff perspective. I hope that it translates into less chase because that's the big thing with him is, is the chase just continues to be high. And from what I've seen so far in the spring, it has been high. If he can cut that down, he's in really good shape. The reason why he's a top 20 prospect, though, even with a fringy hit tool and below average plate discipline is above average game power plus speed and 80 defense in, in center field. You don't find that too often. No, never. Um, I think the question for PCA last year was going to be approach. And now we enter the early stage of this, of this year. And the question is still sort of kind of, 
approach. So it, is it going to be a flaw in his game? I have no idea, but he he just seems like the elevated version of Sidon Rafaela. And Rafaela is becoming a fan favorite with the Boston Red Sox. So it feels like at the very least, you're going to get a fan favorite in Chicago because he's going to make highlight plays and you know he's going to he's going to be electrifying offensively sporadically. You just hope that the offensive production becomes more consistent and then he becomes that all-star level player. How many professional games does he have under his belt? PCA, that's a good question. I think more than you would expect. I I think it I mean it's not going to be a small small number considering that he was drafted in 2020, but I think it's not going to be nearly as many as his peers who especially the high school guys drafted in 2020 considering he, yeah sorry, go ahead no 219 it's not that many it's not that many because he had the shoulder issue you had the the covid canceled season and then that was followed by the, so the covid canceled season followed by the shoulder issue and then he was traded i i, I think it's important to note that he's a high school guy that has really played a season and a half so far i mean you could probably call it like a season and three quarters in the minor leagues that's really yeah. it and a lot yeah. of those games are also getting thrown up to the big leagues and then thrown back down and the trade. And I, I think it's important to know, like we're working to Sedan Rafaela, finally cutting down on the chase, finally becoming more of a well-rounded hitter. He's had a lot more reps at this point than Pete Crow Armstrong, if I'm not mistaken. So I, I think it's hard to be as patient when, when you have someone who is already on the cusp of the big leagues because he's on the cusp of the big leagues. But the fact that he's on the cusp of the big leagues is a testament to how naturally talented he is. I think it's also important to note that the approach and some of those things that he got away with is why he's been able to get up so quickly to AAA and even get the taste of the big leagues. But at the same time, if he was just going level by level a little bit slower, would we have as much you know urgency for him to, to figure these things out? Probably not. But I think because of the defensive ability, he could instantly be one of the best center fielders in baseball. Uh, the power is is there, which is really fun to see as well. I think more than anybody would have expected. It, it's it's making us all, I think, whether it's Cubs fans or you know just the prospect industry, a little bit more eager to see a change with the hit tool. And, and I do think that the overall, whether it's the hit tool or just the overall offensive abilities from a plate discipline and and field to hit perspective, will get there. When I just think it's going to take probably another few hundred at bats and and i i I want i'm very excited to check in in like july or june and just see what it looks like for him because there are some tangible adjustments already with the swing and we just need to see some some adjustments with the approach and also see those tangible adjustments uh translate a little bit more yeah and those are going to happen in triple a yep and low pressure just go out there and play and i think I, i haven't looked at the numbers as a whole so far in triple a but i've i've seen him you know we've been putting out some highlights on the call up he's been putting some good swings on balls so yeah. and he's not caying so i mean those are the things that you want to see we'll see if he can you know just continue to maintain that and, and keep going but uh I, I think he could be up this year as well and, and help them depending especially if there's an injury that's a guy that will plug in and help you defensively without a doubt Number 19, Colt Keith, second baseman with the Detroit Tigers. The big league squad now after that extension, that pre-debut extension that, I mean, you got to be so pumped about if you're a Tigers fan. You just got to be excited about in general in in the prospect industry because of just how fun and just how fun he's been to watch as a minor leaguer. And this was a guy that we did not want to see waste any more time in the minor leagues. And that extension kind of solidified that. And while it's been a bit of a slow start, like it is for many rookies, I'm not worried about it. Uh, I thought he showed some good things in the spring, even though the numbers weren't great. I, he looked comfortable. And I even think so far he's looked comfortable. I haven't seen a guy that's looked overmatched. I've just seen a guy that is still getting his feet under him and figuring out how to do damage the same way he did in in double and triple a colt keith i've talked about it before he got that extension i said one of the safest bats in the minor leagues when you blend the above average hit and plus power and good plate discipline and i stand by it this is one of the safest bats and it seems like scott harris feels the same way yeah let's not panic here he's one for 12 but he played in three miserable weather conditions in chicago and then he went to new york and it was miserable weather conditions then they just had back-to-back games postponed he's got 10 batted balls 
Seven of those 10 are on the ground, but four of the 10 have been hit 95 plus. So like, he's going to be just fine. <laughs> Let's not yeah. slam the panic button because he's not producing like Jackson Chorio. He's going to have a better offensive season than Jackson Chorio is going to have. Because, I agree with that. Yeah. Like, dude, I, at the end of the day, and, and we talked to him and, and I clipped it and, and put it back out when Keith signed his extension, like, he thinks about the numbers. He has numerical goals in mind. He wants to hit 300 with 30 homers and drive in 100. And guess what he did last year in double and triple A? He, he damn didn't near do it like a, like a bum. He came up short. Only 27 I mean, bombs, right? Hit 306 with 27 bombs and 101 driven in. So he fell shy Ooh. of his goals. But add in the fact that he had 38 doubles. Like He's <laughs> always going to do this. And he's not going to be 30, 100 and hit 300 every year. But he's always going to be a, a decent average guy and a decent power guy and a good run producer. If he's given the opportunities, I I have zero doubt that he's going to be a good everyday big league baseball player. I agree. And I'm interested to see how the defense grades out over a larger sample, but he's looked comfortable enough so far. And I think he's going to continue to get better there. He's a little stiff, but I, I, when I'm looking at Edward Julian, be a valuable big leaguer. It's like, it, it, it's going to be better than that. Uh, when it comes to the, the defensive side of things, uh, I, I'm, I'm as high on Keith as any of these the rookies outside of the obvious that are getting run, especially from the offensive side. And uh, I think, especially from a WRC plus perspective, I do think he will. Uh, I think it's very possible he performs better than Chorio this year though. Chorio got his first home run off. That was nice to see. We'll get to that yeah, uh, on the next episode. Uh, but Colt Keith, you got a good one here. If you're a Tigers fan, if you love Kerry Carpenter, you're going to absolutely love Colt Keith because I think he does a lot of the same things, but if you elevate them and then just a better field to hit overall. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm very comfortable with what the Tigers have going on here offensively. And I think they've got a, a lot to be excited about. And Keith is a big part of that. Anytime you are a, a hit first guy, which is what Keith was when he was first drafted. And then you put on a ton of muscle, mm -hmm. like a ton of muscle. That's just the, and then you see that translate in, in the EVs department and, and elevating more. How do you not bet on that? Guy you could already it. hit. He added more muscle and didn't lose any quickness. That always bodes well. Yeah. 18. Unfortunately, a guy on the shelf, Jordan Lawler, shortstop in the Arizona Diamondbacks organization. It's, it's been a little bit of a tough stretch getting up to the big leagues. Just he looked overmatched. That's okay. He was, he's extremely young. Another guy that probably sneakily doesn't have as many minor league PAs as you'd think and got up there. And the, the glove, the whole point was, oh, he should be better than Nick Ahmed. And I think that was a very reasonable uh, just hypothesis. Unfortunately, he just was trying to do too much for a team that clearly was trying to make a push at the end. I, I got to see him in, in a couple big league games live and, and you could just kind of see him pressing in a lot of different ways, both on the field and, you know, in and at, in, at the plate. I think he would have been calmed down this year in AAA and gotten into a rhythm and got back up whenever they needed him if Perdomo wasn't performing. Unfortunately, goes down with that thumb issue out for a couple months. Yeah. End of the day, it's not a huge deal. You hope that he can come back and be just fine. The, the whole point was Perdomo is probably going to get as much run until legitimately he's a detriment or there's another spot opening up somewhere else. Catal Marte gets hurt or somebody else gets hurt and he comes up. So there was no rush with him like he, i think it was going to be a one of those situations where let's get some momentum for a few months let's work on some things in a controlled environment and then get you back up here but now it is unfortunate that he can't work on those things for a couple months now with that thumb issue yeah well and perdomo uh knee issue he came up limp on wednesday so it, it was one of those that i don't think that should alter jordan lawler's course i think they could probably just slap a band-aid on the shortstop position and it doesn't have to be Lawler but Lawler's not healthy so he's not even an option there if Perdomo's out for an extended period of time I've got a question when it comes to game power because you've got 55 future game power he hit 20 homers last year 15 of which came in Amarillo which is a very very hitter friendly place five came in 16 games in Reno which is a very very hitter friendly place you get to chase field and like ball does carry pretty well in Arizona, but at the end of the day, like you can close the roof and it's not Reno or Amarillo. How many homers can this guy hit? Is he a 15 homer guy? 
it's one of the toughest reads. And usually a 55 grade is going to be, you know, that 20 to 25, closer to 25 home run output at their peak is what you're what you're kind of hoping for there. The EVs are average. Yeah, uh, and and I think he's going to get stronger though. I do, uh, especially you know, we got to see how he comes back from the injury, and it might take some time there. But he is a guy that we talk about the outslug, the EVs to the pull side, the Isak Paredes template. He's not Isak Paredes, but he does backspin to the pull side and elevate consistently. So that's why I think, yes, he's really going to maximize that in some hitter friendly environments. But I do think that even if it's in a neutral environment, he's going to be able to just create loft and 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 really, if anything is middle in, especially fastballs, it, it is very similar to Paredes where he does not miss the fastballs and he pulls and elevates fastballs really, really well. And that's that's what Paredes does. That that's what I think Law, what Lawler will will be yeah. be able to do enough to hit twenty plus when he's fully developed. I think that the power may be one of the last things to come because he's kind of fighting for his life a bit at the plate, just trying to make contact, use the speed. But once he's developed and comfortable enough to say, hey, I can really try to pull and lift something here, I think he can grow into 25 homers. He's 21 for the next 100 days. Yeah. Don't forget that. Like he's 21 and he already has big league experience under his belt. Yeah, we share a birthday. Do you so, really? Yeah, July 17th. Wow. So. But I'm unfortunately uh, five years older. Crazy. Craziness. It's weird. It's, it's, it's starting to see the 2004 birthdays is messing with me now. I, yeah, I saw it, 2000. I was writing up a 2006, and I almost just closed the laptop for the day and like just just called it a day. I mean, when was Salas born? Salas was probably born 2005, I think he's a 2006 kid. Oh, I hate that. I like remember shit that happened in 2006. Oh, yeah. We're just talking about the 2006 Marlins, man. Yeah. Like Salas was just out the womb around then. Like, that's crazy. Damn. And, and I know there's people listening to the show that are like, shut up. Like, I'm thinking about that from the year you were born. Uh, like, so, I mean, it's it's craziness. Let us have this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let us feel old. Uh, 17, guy that I know people have been commenting on YouTube saying, I'm excited to hear you talk about him. I'm excited to hear you talk about him. Chase DeLauder, Cleveland Guardians prospect. And guess what? We're already starting to work on those other team top prospect lists. I'm doing two at the same time and just kind of seeing what 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 comes quicker to me and what what which one I feel more inspired with. I'm between the Guardians and the Mets right now. But nice. Chase DeLauder, spring training was crazy. You asked the question on the Just Baseball show when we went through the top 100 list. How much did spring training boost Chase DeLauder for you? And I thought it was a great question because the answer, of course, was a little bit. But maybe not as much as people may think because we get to see him pretty extended in the – Arizona Fall League, where at first it was like, wow, there's a lot more forward move than I'm used to seeing with hitters. But then I watch more ABs and I'm like, wow, this guy's just an exception. Wow. And you get open side in the AFL, you can get so close. Wow. He is so efficient and quick to the ball. Wow. He is so strong. And then I watch him get tied up. I've talked about this swing multiple times, tied up on a pitch up and in with the drift forward. And he not only hits it, Keeps it fair and it gets over the wall. Maybe a little bit of an Arizona carry bump, but the fact that he could hit that out, I think there's some guys in the minor leagues that wouldn't have been able to hit that pitch in that location, in that spot, like out in Williamsport. He has some ridiculous brute strength. He has some ridiculous bat speed. The barrel accuracy is ridiculous. And even though there is some forward move here, this is a guy that just can kind of get away with it. If he does end up being a little bit more in his base and in his back hip, the ceiling could be even more exorbitantly high. But at the same time, this might just be a guy that you don't want to adjust anything. Just hit naturally. Do what works for you. You're you're an exception to some of the hitting rules. But when you are as efficient and powerful as DeLauder is, sometimes you just got to tip your cap and say, this guy, this works for him. I, I can't argue against what this guy's got going for him. And on top of that, 6'4", 235 pounds and a plus runner, he's yeah. he's a freak. So I, is it run times that make him a 60 runner? Because like stolen bases are not really a thing with him at pretty much. It's run time. times for me. Like I'm watching him beat balls into the ground and 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 he's going to beat him out to first a lot of the okay. time. At six, and four, it, I, I think the run times though are a little bit 
it's like the Otani thing where Otani from, and I know he's gotten better at stealing bags, but you remember he was not the most efficient base dealer. He was a very low efficiency base dealer. Yeah. And he posts the best times to first base because he's kind of swinging and already on his way to first. Yeah. The water can be that way too, where he's swinging and he's on his way to first. So he can post elite home to first times. Got it. I, I do think he will be a better base dealer. It's hard to get that mask going and get that first step. And you can kind of work on that switch. And remember, recurrent foot issues. I'd be a little worried to, to steal with the recurrent foot issues. And yeah. maybe you're just not as comfortable pushing off with that first step. I think that first step is coming back. And I do think he can be a base dealer. Regardless, that speed shows up in the outfield. That speed shows up on the base paths. Or, or excuse me, like uh, on the base paths when he's not stealing. Doubles, triples, scoring from first on a gapper. It's valuable, but yeah, I am interested to see how the the stolen base aspect comes along. But what I'm just in love with with Delauder is plus hit, yeah. plus plate discipline, plus game power, plus speed. That could be one of the best prospects in baseball after this year. Yeah. Is there any question that you have with Delauder at this point, or is it just let's see him continue to extrapolate? Um. I mean, so he started his pro career and he didn't play very many games at all last year, but the power numbers were very slow out of the gate. And I guess like my only other question would be, why were they so slow out of the gate? I think, I think it was a little bit of that forward move being more pronounced. I think it was a little bit of the foot issue and, and him struggling with his base on top of that. And now we're seeing him just much more under control. I think you're seeing – he's a guy that, again, like if the big thing with with drifting and it being on your front foot prematurely is it takes away your bat speed. It takes away some of the efficiency of your path. He's still quick. He's still as efficient as can be because he mitigated some of that, and he's also just a freak and, and kind of this alien life form when it, turns, when it comes to how much bat speed he can just simply produce with a short, short swing. He doesn't even need to really finish all the, all the way. He's producing so much whip and impact – that I mean, I've seen him be tied up, almost look like he's punching, check swing, and it's 103. So there's just some punchy ability here and just quickness and and twitch that through the zone, I don't think there's a lot of bats that are that are more powerful through the zone than Delauder in, in a short spurt there. Uh, so I think that's going to always make him pretty effective. But there could be even more power in there, which is scary. And it just comes to elevating a bit more too. Gotcha. 16, guy who we talked about, three hits buried in the Norfolk and Charlotte game yesterday. Colson Montgomery, shortstop in the Chicago White Sox organization. Talk about power potential here. Another guy that needs to tap into it a bit more, and that's going to come as he, I think, just matures more as a hitter and, and learns to elevate a bit more consistently. But I see flashes of Colson Montgomery swings where I'm like, oh, my gosh, this guy could be a monster. Uh, when it's all in sync and he crushes it pull side, it's, it's, it's a wower. The field of hit for a guy that's 6'4", 205 is also really impressive. The approach has also been beneficial for him. I have some questions about the glove at short, and I think fundamentally he could be a bit smoother and the feet can get kind of flat and heavy. I still think his long-term home is third. I know that the White Sox have zero reason to move him off of short and can give him every opportunity at shortstop, and they will. I ultimately think he plays third where the offensive profile will be just fine. Because you have above average hit, plus game power, and a good ability to walk. This offensive profile is going to be a lot of fun from the left side of the plate. Yeah. I. So I guess you have – you answered the defensive questions like he's going to move to third base. Um, I, I wonder – because he's like a hard one for me to get a firm read on um, because he was pushed in 22, in 23 – it was – he was out for like a month or so, right, last year? Mm-hmm. Like a month or two? Yeah, he he, he got a – didn't he get a – he got a late start, I think, with uh, Oblique and something start. else. He's been banged up a little bit as a pro. So, it, it for me at least, it feels like, hey, this guy's been good when he's on the field, but then all of a sudden he was in AAA. It felt like, whoa, why is he in AAA? Shouldn't he be hey, in AA? But, yeah, I mean, last year he played 37 games in AA. And before that, he played 14 games in AA, and he looked like ass because he wasn't ready. Um, it, it's just – it's fascinating to me. And you want to talk about sample. Like, he's got 191 games under his belt. And, and yeah, he's 22, whatever. But 
I mean, he's already in triple A and, and the fact that he did put up a three hit day, you know, good for him. Um, he is somebody that I think is going to go up to the big leagues and I'm like, are we sure he's ready? Mm-hmm. Which is kind of a tough thing for me to get super excited about because you're going to see the struggle and I'm going to watch so many people on social media be like, this guy sucks. Why is he up here? He doesn't suck. He doesn't have much like playing time under his belt. Um, but the tools are just so ridiculously exciting. And and I, what I've really liked from him so far from the spring and in the early parts of this year is, is using the whole field a bit more. He's very pole happy in the past. And I get it because there's a lot of pop to the pole side, but now, you know, just seeing him use the field a bit more, the field for the barrel is so good. You don't need to be trying to catch everything out front. So seeing him be a little bit more complete of a hitter is nice. Seeing him continue to be patient is nice. And I mean, the EVs have been there and 90th percentile 105 last year. And he's got that you know, more room for strength as well. Yeah, There's a lot to dream on. I, I think just yeah, the question is, can he do it consistently, stay healthy over a larger sample? I do think he could end up getting to the big leagues a little quickly and struggling a bit. And, and fans should be patient with him because it's been a unique track for him yes. with the injuries, with Project Birmingham, with some other things. But at the end of the day, he could be an offensive monster who sticks on the left side of the infield and good plate discipline. He's one of those guys that I think that the last phase of his development will still be had at the big league level. And that's fine, especially with where the White Sox are at right now. Yeah, 100%. Number 15, Roman Anthony, outfielder with the Boston Red Sox organization. And also, I think I mean, we've talked about it on the show a little bit, but him and Kobe Bayo being from Stoneman Douglas. That mm-hmm. place is really, I mean, you have Jesus Lizardo, you have Anthony Rizzo, you had Colton Welker. That's going to be another baseball factory. And their team right now, I think, is one of the best in the country. Uh, Stoneman wow. Douglas, just a monster of a baseball program. And Roman Anthony is going to be, along with Mayo, the latest examples of that. Second round pick out of there. Both guys that signed out of high school got overslot to do so. Anthony, 6'3", 200 pounds, but runs well, has a chance to stick in center, extremely patient hitter has flash plus pop. He actually is a little bit different than Colson. Goes the other way really well. We've seen him elevate over the 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 faux green monster in Greenville a ton with ease. His challenge can be elevating to the pull side. He's a guy that I think the forward move takes him out of his path more. Whereas Delauder, you you almost can't take him out of his path because he's so efficient and the turn is so tight. Whereas with Roman, if he gets a little bit drifty, then the bat drags a little bit and it's really hard to turn around pitches to the pull side in the air. And I was very surprised when you start to uh, move the spray chart towards right field, you see the ground ball rate elevate. So to me, that's a little Mm -hmm. bit of a path inefficiency and something that he can clean up. But the fact that he was still so productive, anything middle away, not only was he elevating, he was hitting it hard and using the middle of the field well. And when he did catch a breaking ball out front or whatever, he'll crush it both sides. But it was mostly the hard stuff inside could kind of tie him up and it'd be on the ground. But hits the ball super hard, extremely patient, can run, can stick in center, and super young doing what he did last year. Yeah. I I mean, it is really hard to not look at Roman. It's really hard to look at Roman Anthony and not say, this guy could be a potential perennial all-star. He's still 19 years old and doing what he did he was a guy that kind of got better at each level too because he toes the line of passive and patient. And I think he was a little passive at the lower levels. And at times, I think he knew the strike zone better than the umpires. And then you get him to, to double A where the zone's a little bit tighter and the command's a little bit better. I think we saw that he was almost more comfortable there at points. He is the prospect headliner of maybe the best roster in minor league baseball. And we'll talk about that on tomorrow's show. But I'm curious, how do you fix a bat path inefficiency like that? Is it, a, is it an increased emphasis on staying back? Like what, what is the recipe to fix it? If he is going to fix it? Yeah, I think it's just more reps on one side of it. It's just getting more in control of your body and knowing where you're at in space. And also just, I think it is mostly holding that back hip and just being under control. If you look at Roman Anthony swings, especially the balls that he put on the ground, you'd kind of bail out sometimes and and be on that front foot and you'll see the front like the hips kind of peel out and when you do that you're just going to kind of be out and around the baseball the thing is 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 he's still so good at and the path is is usually 
great in the sense that he enters the zone early. And so if it's middle away and he's pulling off of it, he's still able to stay behind the baseball, lift it and backspin it the other way. But if the pitch is more middle in and you're kind of leaving it, it's harder to be able to lift that, right? Because it's, it's closer to you. How are you going to get the barrel around and lift it when you're kind of pulling off of it? It's just much more difficult. So I think it's a little bit more of just staying on the baseball, staying directional, and then also staying into your backside. Those things come with reps. He's a big kid. Right? He's 6'3", 200 pounds. He was 18 slash 19 last year. You're still kind of getting aware of who, who you are and what your body does in space. So I think as he gets more comfortable with that, I think we'll see him start to elevate to the pull side more. But it's pretty wild. I mean, if you look at the home run distribution, there were – one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine to the opposite field, two to center field, and then three to the pull side. Wow. So it's it's pretty amazing. And but pull side elevation is is a lot easier. And that's usually one of the things that comes along. So that's what's scary about him is like that's he gonna have come the other boxes checked off. Yeah. Yeah. Like he's already going the other way with authority. He's already hitting the ball at 90th percentile, 105. He's already chasing at a sub 20% clip. He's already making above average contact rates. Like as he starts to elevate more, look out. Got you. 14. Another injured player, unfortunately, injured big leaguer. Jason Dominguez, New York Yankees. Uh, I mean, we talked about the the prospect journey for this guy and how he made tangible swing adjustments that have really helped him. And now looks like a guy that is a, a really well-rounded and complete player. Uh, I think we got a taste of that at the big league level. And then unfortunately went down with the torn UCL. It's, I think, a hit tool that now is looking closer to above average from both sides, of the, especially from the left side of the plate. He's always been, not always, and when I saw him in low A, he was not patient, but pretty much since then has been patient. He, You know the power is there. Uh, and and he's not a guy that's going to sell out for lift though. It's hard line drives, and then when he catches, you know, the the right pitch in the right spot, yeah, he'll he'll hit that that moon tank. But he looks like the guy that you know how Albert Pujols always used to say, like I'm not a home run hitter, I'm a line drive hitter. And I think that was just really a mentality for him. I, I see that with Dominguez, where it's like I think he feels like he's a line drive hitter, that a guy that hits line drives that end up being home runs. And I think being that for him is beneficial because. He hits the ball hard. There is already some natural loft. He wants to make a lot of contact. I think it's what allows him to do so. He had a 90th percentile of 106 last year. I think he's going to continue to grow into more power. He was 20 years old last year. And I think a lot of the home runs, if you look at them, they're line shots that just get out. It's not a lot of moon, you know, soaring high fly balls. I like that about him because to me, that is more consistent. That allows him to have, I think, the ability to hit the elevated fastballs that he's going to see plenty of at the big league level. And I think that's why he also got better in that regard as the season progressed, including his big league stint over the final 60 games of the season against four seam fastballs. He hit 352. That I think is a testament to what he's trying to do to, with the baseball and working above it and, and being, you know, more of that line drive guy that ends up hitting home runs. Jason Dominguez, the well-rounded ball player who would have thunk it ever. All right. And looks Never. looks the part in center. I we'll see if they you know, he doesn't they may... have to play center though. Like no. it feels like it's gonna be judge and center long term, you know, big free agent. I assume it's gonna be the guy that's out there and right right now. Like if Jason Dominguez is playing left, that's already a top ten left fielder in baseball. Like left is not a place where you've got star players. He can be a star left fielder, like with a know, mega think... arm. Yeah, with a mega arm. And, like, you sh you should never have a mega arm in left field. And, hell, man, move Soto to left. Have Dominguez play right. He's going to be a hell of a right fielder, too. But the fact that he can hold his own in center is great. But Judge is, like, actually somehow a better center field option. When he <laughs> yeah. comes back, I think Verdugo kind of falls to the wayside. And yeah. you're going to run out Dominguez in left, Judge in center, Soto in right. And Yankee fans are going to be doing backflips. And Spencer Jones could turn into a really good center fielder with his yeah. speed. And, and as he just continues to get reps out there, the other big thing was the right-handed swing was, was far behind the left-handed swing at points really shored that up last year. And I've done some threads and I think I've even, I've read, wrote a story breaking down the swing adjustments that you can find on just baseball.com. And if you use our search bar, but 846 OPS 
as a right-handed hitter last year was a huge stride for him, especially considering where what levels he was playing at. He's he's a higher floor guy than I think people ever gave him credit for, and, and I think the ceiling is still, and maybe it's not Mike Trout, but it's still really high. It's all star, so that's a top fifteen prospect in baseball. Yep. Number thirteen, Kobe Mayo. We mentioned earlier. I talked about him as one of my favorite bats in the minor leagues for some time now, and was also a really fun interview just hearing about the way that he's been able to make some adjustments, the way he's been able to just get healthy and, and some of the double A struggles really being a part of just not being healthy in 2022, getting healthy in 2023, some of the best numbers in double A period, and then some great numbers in triple A he's improved his defense at third base. He is a guy that elevates consistently. This is the opposite. He is not a line drive hitter. He hits hard line drives. Don't get me wrong, but he is a guy that is going to hit you moon tanks and elevate consistently. And that's actually why I like him because you got to look at the different types of players here. Mayo is going to whiff a little bit more than Dominguez. Uh, he's a little bit longer levered and he's going to struggle a bit more with breaking balls. But when he connects, it's going to go 35% ground ball rate last year. The whiff rates are about average, but a 90th percentile of 107 and a half. He manages the, the chase rate really well. So a guy that is just elevating consistently, especially to the pull side, he's not even going to have a problem putting it out. I think in 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 Baltimore, which is you know the polo grounds to left field. Yeah, it's just so hard to look at this bat and say anything other than thirty home runs, and I think he could get to forty. Uh, I, I we've talked about like the Austin Riley offensive similarities, and I'm starting to see that comp thrown out a lot more too. Not yeah, I, and I get it because like I could see a lot of different people just lead to that takeaway when you look at the offensive ability when you look at the way he's kind of progressed you look at the way that the defense can continue to progress but i think he's ahead of where austin riley was at 22 years old oh yeah and and i think that he has a chance to be better if it all comes together the hit tool may not get to where austin riley's has gotten to but I, i think it can and the defense i think will have that similar progression where it's like oh he's he's fine there actually sometimes he looks above average I, mean, I I think he's going to hit enough, and the power is ridiculous. Dude, it took until Riley was 24 in 2021 to, like, really blossom into his own. Like, 2019 was not good, relatively speaking, for Austin Riley. And, and 2020 was, like, not that good, relatively speaking, for Austin Riley. He was a 226 hitter in 2019. So he was selling out for pop, and he ran into 18 of them. But, like, that was kind of all his value. And then 2020 it was more of the same. It's like, yeah, he sold out for pop, but he hit 240. Then he turned into that incredibly well-rounded hitter and one of two guys that has finished top 10 in NL MVP voting each of the last three years. The other one's Freddie Freeman. So (laughs) like we're talking about this guy being Austin Riley light. That's amazing. And the way to beat a deep wall in left field is by hitting the ball 110 miles an hour in the air. And he does that. Like Ryan Mountcastle doesn't all the time. So that's why that wall hurts him. But at the end of the day, if you hit the ball 110 in the air, it's going to leave over any wall in Major League Baseball. I think like there, yeah. there's no polo grounds that exists anymore. Like there's a reason that thing was out of commission in like the 50s. Um, so I, I mean, I, I think that this guy, even with that expanded left field, has 40 homer potential at Camden Yards. 15 batted balls over 400 feet last year. How many batted balls do you think he had over 105 miles per hour? I mean, he had four yesterday. Um, it's it's hard. I don't even want to put a guess 60, out. 67. See, I would have guessed like 100. And Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad we didn't do this again. Uh, we did that in the Just Baseball show the other day. Take a guess, and then you guess too high, and then it ruins it. So, uh, no, but that's 67 as a 21-year-old. In double and triple A, and he's going to blow that out of the water this year. If you know, assuming he's playing a lot more games in triple A, even if we think at the big league level, blow it out of the water. Uh, I mean, already this year, you mentioned he has a handful, he's making plenty of contact, pulverizes fastballs. By the way, I think good sliders will give him issues, and it's just gonna be like, all right, you know, unfortunately, he got beat by a few good sliders. Good reliever comes in and sets him down, and that's where like the development will come over time. Yeah. But when you do what he did to fastballs last year, it's 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 pretty hard to not be successful. When he hits other pitches as well, like it's just the sliders are the one area where it could be a bit of a concern uh, at, at the big league level. 
but 312 with an 1183 OPS against four seam fastballs. I mean, that's absolutely insane. Yes. Number 12, Samuel Basayo, another Baltimore Orioles prospect. Similar to what we were talking about with the out of zone contact thing. That's what makes Basayo so, so good is, I mean, this swing right here that you're looking at on YouTube, that's a ball up. And we talked about how many home runs he hit last year on pitches outside of the zone. It, like that's absurd to do not only at, at any age, at any level, just as a baseball player, but also the fact that he was in his age 18 season and climbing up low A, high A, and then eventually double A to do what he did offensively was amazing. It's one of the best throwing arm. It, I think it is the best throwing arm in the minor leagues. I genuinely, genuinely think behind the dish. I genuinely think it's an 80 arm. The problem is he's also one of the worst framers in the minor leagues, but he's extremely young and that can improve. Eight home runs on pitches outside of the zone, by the way, yeah. which is just crazy. And that's just home runs, not just hits and extra base hits. Like there's a bunch more of those on pitches outside of the zone. The bad is why he's a top 13, top 12 prospect. And the fact that he did what he did at each level last year helps that. And the fact that he has any chance of being able to fill in a catcher and, and, be, and be a catcher is also why he's this high. But even if it's just the bat, he's a top 30 prospect because it's so rare to get this kind of power and this advance of a hit for this age on top of the fact that he could just do damage on pretty much anything. Yeah. So Ethan Salas was pushed. Oh, God. Yuri Perez undergoing Tommy John surgery. Sorry. Yeah. Um, Ugh. I had a feeling about that. Uh, all right. Sorry. I just got the tweet notification from Jeff Passan. Um, there's a difference back to Basayo. There's a difference between Ethan Salas getting pushed to double a and Samuel Basayo being in double a last year where Salas was at age 17. Like he was the young kid that wasn't good in high a, but it was like, Oh, we can push him because like he, he succeeded in low a and he's like, somehow staying above water in high A for eight games. With Basayo, he was manhandling low A. He fully earned that call up to high A. And in you know a month and a half of games in high A, he was like the best hitter in minor league baseball. He had an 1,100 OPS, an 1,130 OPS. Yeah. So like he earned a double A promotion at 18 years old. And that is the difference between Samuel Basayo and Ethan Salas. So if you ask... Yeah. Hey, why is Basayo not 23 and why is Salas not 12? That's why. One of them earned it. One of them was pushed there. And, and I understand that like Salas is the more complete catcher and younger. But at the end of the day, to do what Basayo did offensively last year, it was it was on par with some of the best minor league seasons age to level in in the history of us tracking these kinds of things and put him on par with Mike Trout, Byron Buxton, and and a lot of the best. Uh, and, and I think Jackson Holiday actually. Uh, so it, from that lens, I, I do feel like the framing is going to get better. And if the framing can get to a place where it's even just below average, having the best throwing arm of any catcher in the minor leagues will, will help a ton. The makeup being where it is, and then the bat being where it is. What do you do you understand like what he did in his final 25 games? Like have we, have I like have I walked you through what the numbers were? I think you did when we did the Orioles top prospect, but it would, it would be worth it. I didn't understand it. Like I somehow forgot how insane it was. 25 games. So this was high end double A at the end of the year. 416, 505, 831 slash line, 13% walk rate, 16% K rate, eight home runs. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 18 extra base hits in 25 games as an 18 year old in, or I guess just turning 19 years old in yeah. high end double A. Yeah. That'll play. That's why he's number 12. Number 11, Dylan Cruz. Maybe a little bit lower than people thought. I, It's number 11. <laughs> like, he's the number 11 prospect in baseball. Washington Nationals, it's still you know really high ranking here. We talked about it on the Just Baseball show of just some of the, the smaller concerns that I had that just out of the draft, I was worried about sliders because we saw good sliders in college, especially down the stretch of the season where he would leave them. Uh, he, he can pull off, leave with the front side. Bat kind of leaves the zone early. 
And he could get away with it against bad sliders, cement mixers. He crushes them. Uh, the, the adjustability in the box is really impressive on just about everything else. The lower half is insane. I mean, the hip mobility is it's, it's up there with, with just about any hitter in terms of how he gets into his backside, how he can stay there. But for whatever reason, he gets spinny on sliders. I don't know if it's a matter of pitch recognition or just kind of a swing path thing that gets exposed more with sliders. And it was something that I was like, okay, it's a minor, minor concern, but it's the one thing I noticed with him. And then going into pro ball, seeing that continue to be a thing just made me slightly concerned. It made me just, oh, and again, this is relative to where I would have had him before, which is like seven or eight. It just was something that, you know, most of these guys, they don't have that much of an issue in the top 10 with, with kind of pulling off of these sliders and just having some inconsistency swing wise. The other side is, Elite plate discipline, otherwise good defense and center, a good runner, and a guy that can hit the ball really hard and sprays line drives everywhere. I think that when you look at the upside, though, it may not be as much as a Walker Jenkins or a Wyatt Langford and some of these other guys where I don't think there's going to be the 35 home runs. I don't think there's going to be the uh, the ability to hit 300 maybe the same way. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what kind of gets him closer to 11. But he's going to walk a ton. He's going to stick in center if they need it, if they want him to. He's still going to be a guy that hits in the high 200s, I think. And he can still hit you 25, maybe 30 home runs on a really good year. But I don't think you can dream on you know the 35 to 40 that you might be able to dream on with, with some of the other guys. He's 22 years old. He would be the he would be one of two 22 year olds in the top 10. Wyatt Lankford is in the top 10. He's the other 22 year old. So you know, factor in the idea that James Wood, Evan Carter are still younger than Dylan Cruz technically. And I, I guess, you know, that, that makes sense. And frankly, like Carter, we already saw it. He was just a better prospect than Dylan Cruz coming into the year. You know, like yeah. Cruz put good swings on balls in spring training, but like he really didn't look that big league ready in spring training would look the part. And then some, yeah. so you, you eliminate that. Then you've got Walker Jenkins. Jenkins, the the upside is like 40 homers, like maybe 50 homers. It's it's insane. Um, and then you go to pitchers, Job and Skeens. Okay, that's apples to oranges. It really came down to, for you, I feel like at the end of the day, Dylan Cruz versus Jackson Merrill at number 10. Yeah. And, you know, spoiler for Monday. Exactly. And, and you know, and we'll, we'll talk about what makes, you know, what set Merrill apart when we get to Merrill. Uh, but, you know, I, I think when you look at Cruz at 22, still having some little things to to work on at this point. And it, it is worth noting. And the sliders shoot him up in big league spring training, too. Again, um, you know, I think he was 0 for 9 against them and swung through a bunch. So, like, that's just the, the one thing I want to kind of monitor, see how he adjusts there. But otherwise, I mean, you got a guy that is going to crush fastballs who really doesn't get beat by velocity, who's – plays the game at hundred miles an hour. I love the way he goes about his business, really hard line drives everywhere. Uh, I, I, I feel good. About, and then the plate discipline, I feel really good about his chance of being an above average regular and, and making a couple all-star games. Well, when you look at those other guys that we'll talk about in the next episode, I think you have arguably similar floors and a little bit more at the ceiling. I, I think with Cruz, it's not as much of the fast track situation as we thought, which is okay. It's just, he's going to need to work through, some things on secondary pitches and some things with the swing path. And we'll see how that continues. But when you look at the good everyday center fielder above average power, that could turn into plus as he starts to elevate a bit more. Yeah. Great field to hit and all the intangibles. That's why he was you know the top guy in college. And that's why he's, you know, one of the still top 11 prospects in baseball. Correct. And if you look at this from a negative standpoint, you're like, Oh, Dylan Cruz is in a top 10 prospect in baseball. He's number 11. Yes. Everybody breathe. And- Yes. And again, like it, it is, it is a really well-rounded profile, but yes. when you get to the top 10, it's well-rounded with even more upside. I, I, I would put Cruz near the top of the list of guys. I'm just excited to see over a hundred pro games. I think he was fatigued at the end of last year. I think there was a lot of things going into that and I, I'm, I'm expecting him to put things together this year and have, I, I'm, I think it's going to really happen in the second half where I think he goes nuclear in the second half and reminds everybody kind of what he's got going on, but he's just got to make a few adjustments before then and got to kind of wait and see those. It's going to be crazy when like a couple people in this top 10 graduate and then it's like, oh, wait, guess what? Dylan Cruz is a top 10 prospect in baseball again. Yep. 
and it'll happen very quickly. I, I just, again, just a few little tweaks and I'd expect a guy like Dylan Cruz to be able to make them. He can do a lot of things that you can't teach. Yeah. That'll do it for this episode. We will have the top 10 in the next one. We'll probably do that one on Monday of next week, Jack. Yep. Monday of next week, we'll do the top 10 prospects in baseball. Thanks for hanging with us on these longer episodes as we hammer out the top 100, but we'll be, kind of be back to the 45 minute, maybe sometimes an hour sweet spot on three a week going into next week after we do that top 10. As always, thank you for listening. If you could leave a rating, help us grow the show, subscribe to the YouTube, would really appreciate it. Support those bonus subscription episodes, which you can subscribe to with the link in the episode description. That would be awesome as well if you are up for it. Have a great weekend. Look forward to talking prospects with you on Monday.